Hello. Hi, Hi, Anne. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, so I think a few people might be joining at the moment okay. um, and we can kind of repeat a little bit about what we're doing. But um, I've been really lucky um, to secure Miss <laughs> Angela Pierdovini, um to the LinkedIn Live today just to discuss the growth of, of fintech and AI in combination, but also um, kind of career tips as Ange is working well in a in a finance organization um she's kind of got a, a few kind of tips um and tricks let's say about this sort of area so um i thought it'd be really helpful just to kind of hear your point of view and everything um and also anything that you can share with kind of people who could be looking to enter this space um but yeah i just thought it'd be interesting to see because obviously we work with quite a broad field not only in the uk but across europe etc so um it would be good to know where you're all joining from today roughly um and kind of why this this linkedin live was interesting to you um just so that we can kind of see and kind of hopefully navigate this around um who is on the linkedin live today um but I guess if it's possible, really, it would be really good to, um, I guess, if you could just give a bit of an intro, Angela, about who you are and a bit about your background and where you are now with Shilpay. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as you introduced me, my name's Angela and I am the Talent Acquisition Lead at Shieldpay. Um, my background, I've been in recruitment for about four or five years now, which seems totally crazy to, to say it's gone so quick. Um, but I've always pre predominantly sort of recruited engineering positions, software engineers, mm -hmm. software developers. And ever since, you know, coming into Shieldpay, which is obviously a much smaller company, I've been recruiting for a variety of roles. Obviously, you know, still tech, but also financial crime and products and a bunch of other things. So, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And I actually, um, for those who don't know, and probably most people won't know, mm -hmm. we actually um, used to work together here at Understanding. So um, I've worked with Ange before. I know she's actually awesome at her job um and also yeah that's kind of how I know um and from from now to yeah um so hi Andrew how are you doing um so yeah we kind of prepared a little bit of a where we're going to go with this just to make sure that we don't just go off on a tangent like we probably normally would Ange yeah. um and keep the point a little bit um but we're going to be discussing today um, a little bit of actually about Shield Pay as an organisation. Obviously, um, Angela can't share everything, but just a little bit. And then also um, a bit of a discussion around getting into the finance space, fintech space, um, and kind of finish up on the evolution of fintech with the use of AI. And then we'll hopefully have some time for questions at the end. Um but I guess if I could just ask with begin with a couple of questions, Ange. Um, I guess my first one would be: What to you um, is unique about working in this sort of fintech startup space compared to the more traditional financial organisations? What would you kind of say in and around that? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, you know, if I really think about it, I think it's it's such a different kettle of fish working you know a big organization compared to to someone that's a lot smaller um i think fintech and startups in in particular and, and also scale-ups they offer a lot more opportunity compared to your more traditional sort of financial institutions um you know there's a lot more innovation um the, the environment itself is a lot more nimble, a lot more agile. Um, and you really have the chance to sort of shape solutions, you know, influence strategy. Um, and you also get to witness a lot of the, the impact that your work is having, which is obviously really great. Um, mm. You know, it's super dynamic and you're not sort of bound by the layers of bureaucracy that you would get at those bigger companies. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's super exciting, obviously, to be, you know, able to actually make make a difference in in yeah. a company and um not just that you know in the industry as well it's it's really great <laughs> yeah yeah and how long have you been with Shilpay now 
so not too long. I've been here for five months now. And obviously, you know, previous, I was at Funding Circle, which, um, you know, is still within fintech, but mm. a very different company in the sense that, um, you know, they were much bigger. Um, so, yeah, it's been a, a bit of a learning curve. Yeah. For me too. Yeah, it's quite good, though, just to have those different environments and you learn so much from both. There's no kind of best way, let's say, but I think you learn a lot quickly. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of shield pain itself, what would you say you've noticed about the company values and culture just at, at that organisation? Yeah, absolutely. I think working, you know, just due to the nature of the business, you tend to be a lot more close knit with everyone that you you work with. And it doesn't necessarily matter if, you know, you don't have sort of run ins with that team day in, day out. You still, you know, tend to find that there's there's more of a close knit community in that sense. Um mm-hmm. In terms of, you know, the the rest of the culture, I guess, I mean, that's really come across to me, particularly having come from a bigger company, is the fact that, you know, it's it's an open environment compared to, Mm. to, you know, other environments that I've been in. Um, Diverse perspectives are really valued. You know, we tend to act with a lot of integrity. You know, the the customer also being a a more kind of product-led company is is really important. So Mm. it's all about, you know bringing people together that kind of have that mindset and want to you know have a commitment I guess to to you know creating and building those those fintech solutions but also you know in an ethical way as well um so yeah, yeah I think it's like a really nice sort of environment to to be in um and yeah like I say you know overall I would say really supportive and, and inclusive is what would really stand out yeah awesome Um, And I think, yeah, that definitely comes through in like how you kind of talk about the company even outside of work. Um, So that's really good to hear. Um, Okay, and then I guess if we're talking a little bit um, more about just generally getting into a fintech, Mm -hmm. um, I did have a couple of questions for yourself, Ange, just because you're looking at CVs every day, you're looking at kind of interview feedback, et cetera, and conducting a lot of interviews yourself. Yeah. Um, So... In terms of, I guess, skill sets, and I do know that um, this does vary role to role, you know, Mm -hmm. and you are recruiting more of a wide range of roles in a startup environment. Are there any kind of common skills or qualifications that kind of stand out to you now when you are kind of looking at CVs, let's say, in the engineering space? Um. Hard to say. I mean, there, I mm. I sort of wish there was. I wish there was like a like you know perfect formula where if you yeah. you know had all this experience, you'd be the absolute perfect candidate. But I do think when it comes to hiring candidates for for fintech roles in in you know in particular, we do prioritise both a blend of sort of technical and soft skills because it's also really important that you're fitting into the environment that you're going to be coming into. So yeah. you know in terms of engineering obviously strong proficiency in a programming language would obviously always be what we look for um yeah. but also you know data analysis cyber security is is essential as well particularly when when we talk about um fintech but also you know as as far as the sort of you know characteristics of a person adaptability problem solving and, and communication and equally as crucial as, as being yeah. a programmer and, and knowing a language. So, yeah, just given the, the nature of, of the business and, and the industry, given that it's fast paced and, you know, collaborative, you, you need to sort of have the, the, the soft skills alongside the, the technical skills. Yeah, and I think that's really important for you to kind of note there because I think in a startup environment, not that soft skills aren't important in a bigger company because they absolutely are, mm-hmm. but I think it's just given the nature of a startup scale up, you are in a position where you are around the same people, you do have to pick up on um, different skills and wear different hats, and communication is so, so vital just because of that nature, like I said. So, um, just for candidates I guess um from what you're saying just don't kind of go fully in on just um technical skills because soft skills will be just as important when you're reading that CV and I guess that loops into my next question when you're looking at a CV what what stands out to you if you just kind of had one in front of you now Mm -hmm. what would be kind of the, the key 
pointers for you? Um, a few things, really. I mean, crafted like a really standout CV is, to me, you know, more than just sort of listing your experience, which is obviously, yeah. you know, really, really important. But I'm also really interested in candidates that can showcase sort of tangible achievements and contributions. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, really value when candidates are um you know, in their CV are talking about projects they've been involved in and what their particular role was within that as well and how they've made an impact. Um, You know, and on top of that as well, demonstrating your your sort of passion for fintech through you know any personal projects certifications mm. that you've done in your in your own time and um also something that I, I think goes a long way as well is is tailoring almost the the cv mm. to, to match the sort of roles that you're applying for um you know we'll, we'll show recruiters and interviewers and hiring managers that um you know you're you're really interested in 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 that particular role yeah yeah Okay, awesome. Um, Just on that note, you know, when you are looking at a CV, how important would you say academic backgrounds or degrees are for the sort of fintech space or finance space when you kind of look at your broader experience in in talent acquisition? Mm -hmm. Is it the be all or end all? How important would you say it is? Um, I would say, is it the be all and end all? No, probably not. I mean, fintech as a whole, you'll find is a really sort of diverse industry. So we do actually really value a variety of academic backgrounds as well. Um, And I'm not just talking degrees here. I'm also talking coding boot camps and uh, apprenticeships and all of that kind of thing. But um, I would say if, you know, I was looking at someone that came from your sort of traditional university background, degrees in sort of finance, computer science, economics, engineering, they're all really commonly sought after. Um, But again, you know, I really appreciate candidates from related fields that can bring a bit more of a unique perspective as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what really matters when you get down to the sort of crux of it is your ability to apply the knowledge that you've got into actual real world fintech challenges that would probably I would say be more important than than any education background okay cool and when you're kind of looking at applications or even when you're kind of looking at onboarding Mm -hmm. how many people roughly speaking come from a sort of finance fintech background or Mm -hmm. do you see a lot of people coming into your business for example from like more varied backgrounds what Mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that yeah, um, it's a tricky one, really. Um, just because, of course, you know, the, the, the applications that I look at a lot of the time and the sort of more specialised roles, you will naturally tend to find people that have come from sim- similar environments. And obviously, yeah. you know, prior fintech experience is, is always valuable, but I would definitely say it's not the only path. We do welcome candidates from, you know, related industries like traditional finance that they can bring skills you know like risk assessment financial modeling uh, they've also got regulatory knowledge which is really important so mm-hmm. I think you know showcasing that ability to adapt and then quickly um, quickly you know learn as you kind of go can make you a really strong contender even if you you haven't got the direct fintech experience yeah okay that's good to know and I think sometimes there are some misconceptions um around that particularly in with, with like a historic industry like finance it's now fintech um so that's really helpful mm-hmm. um what would you say is and you feel free to kind of share the process roughly with with shield pay but what would you say is the standard like application process for like a fintech or a finance company what would you say to expect generally um i would say you know just Given from what I, you know, what I know of, obviously, Shield Pay now and and the companies I've I've been at previously, I would say particularly when you're being considered for fintech roles, you will tend to find that they move a lot quicker. Um, mm-hmm. you know, for example, our interview process is oftentimes two stages, and you know, wow. sometimes three. Um, but more often than not, it's two stages. I think it's really critical you know 
from a like a talent attraction perspective to keep candidates engaged but also you know we want to assess candidates quite thoroughly as well and make yeah. sure that we're bringing the right people through the doors so um yeah like I say you know you'll tend to find that the recruitment process is usually quicker usually shorter um when we're talking um about engineering positions in specific I would very much still ex expect a lot of um you know engineering roles to have some sort of coding challenge or a, a live pair programming session which is becoming really popular um so yeah I would say you know very quick very speedy but also it will be thorough and particularly for engineering you know they will want to see some evidence of, of your coding abilities as well yeah yeah exactly so it just because it can feel quick doesn't mean that you should go into those interviews expecting not to be you know really tested and also for interviewers to dig in just as much as potentially they would do yeah um in a in a longer stage process um okay perfect do you have any sort of red flags would you say just that you've seen and you just think oh my goodness why have you done that or I wish they hadn't included that in their CV or interview you know just so people know because I think sometimes you just don't know what that that actually isn't the right thing to do yeah no absolutely I mean I don't want to tell all here but um yeah yeah one, <laughs> one red flag um that I could definitely you know say that I've come across is a lack of sort of enthusiasm or mm -hmm. you know sometimes a failure to demonstrate like a genuine interest not just in in fintech but also the, the company that you're interviewing for um you know the same way that you sort of uh would want a company to, to really want to employ you it has to be mutual so mm -hmm. you know we'll oftentimes sort of fight the corner of the candidates that really want to be here and that really want to work with us so um yeah th that's one thing I would say you know that the lack of sort of um the enthusiasm but also in terms of CVs oftentimes you know incomplete applications or a mismatch between like your skills and and the role can obviously mm -hmm raise concerns you know attention to to detail really matters and being prepared is is absolutely key for going through the process with with any company um yeah. you know not just shield pay and also not just fintech as well yeah okay that's that's helpful i think what i always struggle with is when um, I'm qualifying a candidate and I just don't get any questions I, yeah. I kind of you know when I do say oh, have you got any questions um, and a candidate's like no not really um, if we're in quite quite deep in with an application I do find that slightly worrying just because I'd, I'd ex if it was me and I was really serious about the role I definitely would want to find out as much as I can um, so I think you know even if if with your recruiter you're not kind of discussing or asking many questions mm -hmm. it's so imperative that you ask the interview host as much as you can yeah. um not only will you actually come out feeling a lot more clear and have a bit more transparency your side but that will show so much more engagement um so that's just a really small thing that I think people can just implement into their application and onboarding mm -hmm. process um as as well um and then I guess the last question I had um sorry I'm just picking your brain a lot here <laughs> um, but just in regards to kind of the fintech piece mm -hmm. um what do you think are the sort of transferable skills say someone coming from like a big bank or a more mm -hmm. established finance companies what do you think maybe the skill gap sometimes is and what do you think the more transferable skills are yeah, so this can be really, this can be a tricky one. I think, you know, of, oftentimes in terms of skills gap, it can be a really big learning curve when, you know, you've been at a big company and you, you tend to find that even if, you know, you're in a very similar role or in the same role, you end up getting siloed because you've still got, you know, a team of five or 10 or 15 or however big that team is to sort of fall back on and each of you, you know, ends up looking after a very specific thing within that function so I think yeah. from coming from a big company into you know a scale up a startup or, or just a smaller company in general it can be um you know a little bit of a of a shock to suddenly be 
you know, involved with and looking after the, the whole yeah, sort of, and, and... you know, the, the whole sort of function, if you will, or, or your mm. whole area. So I think that can be, you know, a, a little bit of a learning curve. Um, in terms of, you know, transferable skills, definitely what I will say is when, you know, someone's come from a more of a traditional finance background, um, again, like I mentioned earlier, you know, regulatory compliance, financial analysis, and, and an understanding of market trends can be super, you know, super valuable uh, when mm-hmm. you're coming into a, a fintech business. But like I say, you know, and like I mentioned previously, your ability to sort of navigate more complex financial landscapes and, and communicate insights effectively can can still make you a really great asset to a fintech company, even if totally. you, you do come from your more traditional finance background. Perfect. Okay, that thank you so much, because I know I've asked a lot of you there, but um, <laughs> I I actually think there's definitely some some learning curves there and just a lot of maybe misconceptions around this industry and, and how to apply and what's interesting. Um, so hopefully that was helpful and we can run back to some sort of questions at the end. Um, I know there was some eagerness in the chat to kind of talk about the evolution of fintech um, and the use of AI. Um and I know this is a quite exploratory piece for a lot of companies in fintechs, and I'm sure you can't, you know, shed anything too explicit from from <laughs> Shield Pay because there is an element that we need to keep under wraps. Um, but this has been quite an exciting and interesting area for me to personally look at. Um, and something I thought about was kind of how AI is used within fintech because stereotypically and I know kind of from your experience there can be kind of a little bit more red tape or maybe rules um, to follow Um, and I think AI is used differently in fintechs for sure or due to this due to the sort of sensitive financial data and like the transactions Uh Um, so it is really important to have sort of ethical considerations and think about kind of the moral standpoint um, as well as compliance. Um, So I think that's something um, really tricky that I think the finance industry is going to have to kind of come up with the sort of ethical elements of that Mm -hmm. and how we're going to use this data in a compliant ethical way I don't know if yeah. you had any thoughts on that as well because it's a tricky one to navigate this question yeah I mean definitely I I do think um you know to answer your question I guess short in, in short yes I definitely think um AI should be used differently in in fintech um you know we've got especially being regulated we've got a really big responsibility you know to our customers to the regulators so of course you know we, we can't just plug in AI wherever we we feel like it but also I think you know your more sort of larger generative AI platforms are all built on human text so you know Mm. they do have biases so we we have to be really careful you know what we use it for and how how we use it yeah totally um and this is a bit of a like lead on question Uh um have you seen, you know, in your experience, and obviously, like, just to preface this, me and Ange aren't technical people. We work <laughs> a lot with technical um, candidates and clients, but of course, we're not experts. Um, but do you think, in your experience, AI has helped fintechs and financial companies to make sense of the huge amounts of financial data, like compared to other industries, um, it is a lot on a daily basis coming in. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, um, AI itself, particularly, you know, in our case, we use a lot of AI in terms of neural networks and machine learning. Um, You know, in fact, we use it on our sort of auto reconciliation processes and, you know, to begin to sort of draw patterns and and make our processes sleeker. So I definitely think there is a place for AI at fintech companies, you know, to, to help sort of, like you said, make sense of that really sort of complex you know and and oftentimes there's a lot of data too so um yeah definitely I think that there's you know a place for for AI especially um with with financial data 
Yeah, exactly. I think it just takes some a lot of the legwork out, let's say, yeah. um, just due to like the vast amount. Um, but it can also a lot of the time kind of analyze that data much quicker. And yeah. I think that's kind of as well where, you know, the likes of Shilpay are using it is just to use it have a quicker turnaround time Mm -hmm. it's not there to replace people's job in this case it's just there to kind of spot those patterns make things easier for the people working there and also kind of if there is that anomaly that isn't spotted from human eye that that can be quickly spotted so I think there's different elements to it and there can be a bit of fear around kind of is this going to take my job um but we hope that actually it's just there to, to make people's life easier um, yeah. in this scenario at this point in time. And obviously, who knows what's going to happen? No, um, absolutely. I, I mean, I don't think anything is here to replace the human touch. So, um, you know, I think like if I don't think AI will take anyone's job, but I think, you know, a person that knows how to use it probably would take your job mm. so I think yeah, it's, yeah. More, it's more of a piece around you know being educated and actually using it to, to your advantage and and you know incorporating it into a lot of your workflows and, and what you do day to day as well yeah cool and do you think I mean you just said that but do you think AI will start to change the type of job titles you'll see and that you'll advertise for in a fintech market Mm, it's that's an interesting one I mean I think eventually probably yes um for example you know I know that in terms of engineering for example we we use a lot of co-pilot um you know and it's it's obviously making our engineering team's lives so so much easier um so yeah Mm. I think at some point job titles will probably change yes um the requirements will probably change um so yeah (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I do think so as well. I think I've seen kind of the very stereotypical sort of software engineering role. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I've started to see from a lot of organizations is the add on of do you have any deep learning frameworks? Have you used the likes of PyTorch or TensorFlow? Yeah. So that slow integration of some of those tools mm-hmm. with your more standardized software engineering capabilities, I think that's starting to merge. Yeah. Um, and I just, my, my thought would be what will happen to like the software engineer versus the machine learning engineer? Will we see that sort of merge together almost in the future so that people kind of have a rounded um sort of a rounded profile and have skills in both but of course this is um all theory so we'll see <laughs> but, um, yeah I think that that's an interesting one um have you seen it in the sort of companies I mean when I say it have you seen AI change how how your organized organizations that you've worked for change slightly or kind of evolve um yeah, absolutely. You know, I've seen it change a few things. Like, like I say, you know, for engineering teams, for example, you know, Copilot yeah. is a really good tool at the moment to, you know, sort of bounce ideas off of, I guess. Um, you know, and, and also, you know, it's, it's all predictive. So, it, of course, it makes things a lot, a lot quicker. So, if anything, I think it's actually freeing up a lot of time, particularly for engineering teams to actually, you know, do the exciting bits and the innovation and and work on the architecture piece rather than you know always be sort of more bogged down I guess with the day-to-day and and writing the code you know because that that process is is inevitably going to get quicker and quicker yeah totally okay cool and I guess just a few things I've seen just seeing the sort of crossover and and clients in the space is, is stuff like for example fraud and um catching that out using you know the AI capabilities so again like kind of what we were saying before with anomalies and patterns that don't just kind of look right um those sort of machine learning algorithms are coming in to sort of update and identify like any new fraud tactics Mm -hmm. and that's where it's kind of ahead of us and and has more of a like proactive approach I guess um and then like customer experience, for example, I feel like that's really 
taken major leaps and bounds within finance. And, you know, that's something that me and my team have been working on in terms of hiring a few candidates um, into a finance organisation that are looking to evolve their chatbot capabilities. Mm -hmm. Um, so then you see sort of the personalization, large yeah. language models and and those sorts of things. So um, I would say for anyone kind of looking to merge those two together, I would definitely look at kind of where companies are expanding their AI capabilities and just two of those, you know, you'll find way more just do, by doing um, a Google search, but, you know, fraudulent and like anomalies within algorithms and stuff like chatbots and NLP, I would start mm -hmm. looking into because I do think that is going to become more and more of a norm um, yeah. for, from what I can see. Um, do you want to jump to a couple of questions, Angela? Would you have time to? Well, I mean, I don't. I guess we'll have a look at um, maybe a few. And this one's for you. I'll, I'll read it out. Hi, Angela. Nice to know about your background. As funny as it may sound, I was wondering what what is the best time that you, as a talent acquisition, look into applications. Um, I generally believe the timing does play an important role in added to your qualifications and experience so I guess time of day mm. um what what would you say I I mean I know that knowing you you look all across the day yeah <laughs> so, yeah um, no absolutely like yeah no absolutely I mean I would um I think the timing thing can be you know really tricky and I think it really depends on the sort of volume of applications that are coming through for a specific role you know in particular if I was thinking about engineering roles um I look I check them throughout the day my my the first thing I do when I log on in the morning is check applications that have come in and I check them at lunch and I check them before I log off so oh, yes. um you know timing I wouldn't say is necessarily the the be all and end all however you know when we're talking about um the sorts of roles where perhaps there isn't as much of a skill shortage um, and you get more applications coming through, I would definitely say, uh, you know, the, the ones that get seen first anyway are the ones that, you know, apply early in the morning because then I come mm. and clear the inbox when I log on. So it really depends, but I, I don't think it applies to engineering roles necessarily but obviously you know I'm, I'm happy to to sort of be challenged on that too um it's just what I personally find with yeah. the, the roles that I work on I, I would actually completely agree with you on that mm -hmm. um I would I would say you know first thing in the morning are the first that get seen it doesn't necessarily mean they're the ones that get kind of yeah progressed absolutely um so and just you know if you're doing your job right as a recruiter you're looking all day every day um but again applications are something that I would take with a pinch of salt purely because in terms of my job at least and, and I'm definitely sure with Angela as well a lot of what we're doing is headhunting yeah. so um applications are great but in terms of you know relying on just an, an application um I don't think that's everything um so a lot of recruiters will just be kind of doing searches and trying to find the best talent for the role and that can sometimes actually just mean that we're contacting you yeah. um so just something to note there um and then we got a second question um what do you think about the job market right now um is it harder to find a job compared with the like pre-COVID-19 sort of market? Um, it's a tough question. It's a hard one, actually. Um, I would definitely say the job market is totally different to what it was mm. before COVID. Um, there's no two ways about it. It's totally different. Um, yeah. You know, not only that but it, I think it's also very specific to industry and very specific to certain roles obviously yeah. you know beginning of this year was was really tough a lot of you know tech companies made a lot of people redundant and you know there was no no jobs at the time but I definitely think it's peaks and troughs just like yeah. it was in, in COVID so I think you know it got really tough during COVID and then post pandemic you know things were great salaries were inflated um there was roles you know 
everywhere. So I, I yeah. definitely think it will get back to a point um, where it will be like that. I just think we're, you know, unfortunately in a in a trough right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think just with the likes of like tech, I think for a while it will be kind of the ups and the downs and, and you've got to kind of kind of numb yourself to that to an extent yeah. because it, it's just such a it's one of the fastest growing industries there's something new every day evolving and with that it's just not kind of got the stability of, a, of another industry um but that doesn't mean it's a bad market to get into because there's just so much opportunity for you okay. um I just think actually it's just been so much more highlighted actually in the media, et cetera, in terms of the tech market. So um, sometimes that does kind of add the fear factor, but there's definitely still loads of opportunity, still loads of growth. Um, and I actually think we're kind of on the up a bit now again um, on the roller coaster of tech. <laughs> so um, yeah, it, it's kind of a bit of perspective on that, but it's, you know, the biggest change for me would probably be, you know, people working everywhere in the world and having that remote flexibility and just general flexibility. Um, and I feel like although there has been a bit of a move more back into the office as of recent kind of months, we still see so much more flexibility than ever before with COVID. Um, so that is something actually that hopefully provides more opportunity for people who may not be from, you know, i.e. London, they can still work for a London organization and still get that experience. So, um, yeah, I, I think so. Um, do you, th Oh, what, what about data science? Um, what about data science? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you mean in terms of, uh, the growth of data science in the sort of FinTech market, um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I guess in terms of, what I've seen there is still a lot of um a lot to be done and a lot of I mean I for me data science and machine learning depending on what the skills are because those two job titles ML engineer and data science one company could mean the same thing one company could use data science and mean a machine learning engineer so we're still in that period where there is that kind of I guess lack of clarity yeah um, but what I would say is I'm seeing as much growth in, in data science opportunities where you are looking at more at the statistical side and more of the kind of insights from data as the sort of more um, ML algorithms and, and deployment of machine learning products so I think if I'm honest there's not kind of one that's standing out to me over the other um, just from what I can see in the market um, and do you think there is a master's, do you think a master's is required or just desirable for a progressive career in fintech? What do you think? Yeah, I don't think it's required. Um, and, you know, is it desirable perhaps for certain roles? Um, I can't confirm or deny, but I definitely don't think, you know, it is a, is a, it is a must. Um, I know plenty of candidates I know plenty of colleagues that um don't have master's degree so yes. I, I don't think it is a an absolute requirement no yeah totally and then Kyle asked what popular cloud platform do you see um AWS GCP or Azure and fintech AWS AWS yeah a hundred percent okay cool well that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say just from what I'm seeing as well, AWS for sure. I think perhaps GCP at times comes in, um, depending on whether people are keeping it quite open, which cloud they use for certain projects. And often that's at more of like a startup, very early on startup when you're still discovering what cloud platform you're going to use. I will say I'm seeing a lot less of Azure. Um, mm -hmm. But these 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 uh, platforms still have their place, so that's something to mention. Um, and then the last question: How do you see the Java market compared to Python in twenty twenty three? Oh, this is a tough one. Um, I think personally, just from what I've seen, uh, the 
that the Python market seems to have a little bit moment, more momentum behind it than, than mm. Java. Um, I think particularly, you know, I obviously will have a very sort of skewed view of the market because I only ever really look at fintech in terms of, you know, when I'm doing like competitor na- analysis or, or anything like that. So I would definitely, you know, say Java is perhaps more used by like your bigger banks and, mm. um, you know, your companies that have more more sort of legacy code behind them. Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, Python has definitely got a lot more momentum behind it. But as you know, you know, it can swap and change um, whenever it feels like it so yeah yeah (laughs) yeah totally um I can't speak too much on that obviously I I mainly work with Python just due to the machine learning aspect of my work um but but yeah um okay perfect well oh we got one more one more (laughs) snack um do you think contracting is the best way to get into fintech roles at the moment I have no idea. So, Angela, you're going to have to share share your wisdom on this one. Um, I think it's a bit of a double edged sword, if I'm honest. Contracting, I think, like, I think absolutely, it's a, it's a great way to get your foot in the door if, um, you know, that's what you need to do. But I think you have to be really careful to not sort of contract too much if if your ultimate goal is is to you know go permanent at a fintech because you tend to find that with contracting you'll be exposed to very specific parts of a project um you won't get exposure throughout a whole development life cycle so i think that can be really dangerous Um, Mm. and can actually you know sort of almost become like a bit of a sticking point when you're being considered for permanent roles so um I would say it depends what your ultimate goal is um if you really enjoy contracting and you want to stay a contractor then yeah absolutely if not then you know I would say it's probably yes really beneficial to get your foot in the door but you would probably want to think about going permanent sooner rather than later okay yeah yeah my always instinct if you actually just want to have a career in a specific industry and you're really excited about that industry is that contract isn't maybe the way to go long term um so that would be my my just initial reaction but of course yeah it, there's lots of different factors to it and I I think yeah I think long term like you said Angie it it's probably not the best way to go because then you might get find yourself stuck in contract mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as opposed to you know actually getting really hands-on in in a project long term um, with a company um okay perfect well thank you so much Angela for your time and your energy um (laughs) it's um always lovely to speak to you and um yeah I guess if if there are any questions we haven't been able to answer just because of time we'll try and work our way through them and um, reply to any comments for, for those that we feel like we've missed um, but please definitely connect with Angela and give her a bit of a shout out um, as well and yeah I will be um, in touch soon I guess the last thing is just to check out um, our LinkedIn page um, and also check out Shield Pay's LinkedIn page as well um, which I'm sure will be in Angela's bio anyway um, too. But yeah, thank you so much. And thanks so much for everyone for joining so much. We appreciate it. (laughs) Bye.